We all know that our system is currently far from ideal, that there are many aspects of it which are broken. We all are experiencing uh, the work that's associated with trying to provide the level of care we wish and uh, aspire to provide uh, uh, with uh, what seems to be always insufficient time. It's clear also that major system change is underway and we have to actually solve these problems of access and quality of care if we're to remain viable uh, going forward. So I'm going to try to be a little philosophical in terms of what do we need to do <laughs> to survive uh, and to prosper in a time of great uh, transition and change. And I think the key to success is keeping focused on why are we here and what is it we're trying to do. The mission for the East Boston Neighborhood Health Center was defined by our consumer board of directors from the very outset <clears throat> of wanting to provide easily accessible, high quality, comprehensive care for all of those who lived and worked in the community, regardless of their age, income, insurance status, language, culture, or social circumstances. Our board of directors also, whoop, I did it too far, sorry. Uh, had a very strong sense of uh, concern for the community as a whole, not just those patients who showed up. Uh, and uh, the public health mission was, has been a central part of the East Boston Health Center as well. And all of us uh, at East Boston and the Health Net Health Centers share with Boston Medical Center the mission of exceptional care without exception. <clears throat> so what's the history? Um, I actually arrived at Boston City Hospital in 1963. Uh, to place that, there was no Medicare for the elderly. There was no Medicaid for the poor. Uh, this was a 1,300 bed charity hospital with all of the dysfunction and uh, baggage that that title carries. When I was in the outpatient department on the corner of <coughs> East Concord and uh, Harrison Avenue, we had two appointment times, uh, 8.30 in the morning and 1 o'clock. And patients waited on 15 rows of wooden benches to be seen by a house officer, uh, often not supervised, often without a chart, operating off a blank filler paper to try to meet at least the acute needs of that day. Uh, we have come a very long way. There has been continuous improvement, but we're <clears throat> entering a phase of, I think, accelerating improvement in which that's going to be essential for all of us. Uh, 1963 was also the year that Martin Luther King gave his I Have a Dream uh, speech on the Washington uh, Mall and the year that uh, John F. Kennedy uh, was assassinated. <clears throat> the following year, uh, Lyndon Johnson, uh, as a new and uh, legislatively savvy uh, president was able to move through uh, the Congress the Great Society programs, uh, which included the <clears throat> uh, War on Poverty, uh, the Office of Economic Opportunity, Head Start, <clears throat> and the first health centers began to be formed. The very first health center was uh, in Columbia Point, st started by my friend Jack Geiger and Count Gibson, and <clears throat> uh, he uh, invited uh, the young Ted Kennedy to come tour the health center. Uh, Kennedy was so impressed with the mission of the health center that he went back and managed to get through uh, a, a, a addition to uh, the uh, war on poverty law, uh, an additional $50 million to uh, spread community health centers. And <clears throat> that basically, uh, led to a proliferation of health centers across the country, but particularly in Boston. Uh, in Boston, we uh, rapidly grew to over 30 health centers. And the Department of Health and Hospitals played a very central role in helping organize health centers throughout the city, uh, uh, going out and doing community organizing, going out and uh, helping uh, health centers uh, 
identify space and facilities, uh, and uh, providing uh, logistical support for these very shoestring ad hoc operations uh, through something called the Central Support Office, which was located in Castle Square. Um, the <coughs> Um, there we go. I'd like to talk about three aspects of, e of the East Boston Health Center, which I think are particularly relevant to our future as we go forward. One is the development of clinical services, the second is the community-based research programs, and the third is special programs that have been developed around the needs of uh, medically complex and high-risk populations. In terms of clinical services, we started out as a very shoestring operation in a old George Robert White Fund building. You'll still see maybe 20 something of these buildings scattered around Boston. Uh, they had been the site of well baby clinics, uh, public health dental programs, and public health nursing. Um, we cobbled together a, an adult medicine department. I was approached by someone from the Central Support Office, Joe Karens, to see if I would help the health center get started. And uh, the adult medicine consisted of four evenings a week, a different doctor each, week, week, uh, each night working with me. Uh, pediatrics was a uh, retired pediatrician commuting from Providence, uh, Rhode Island, and obstetrics and gynecology was basically the prenatal care was provided by residents from Boston City Hospital and, the, and family planning nurses uh, from the family planning program. So those were the, the, uh, the beginning pieces. We also inherited something which I think has been very important and central to our growth and our ability to meet the needs of the community as the community finds them, and that was we, re we inherited something called the East Boston Relief Station. The relief station <coughs> uh, had been present uh, as an outpost of the Boston, Boston City Hospital accident floor uh, dating back to the 1800s. Uh, there was, used to be a, uh, a uh, relief station in the North End as well. Um, and when the health center opened, we basically took over operating that 24-hour, seven-day-a-week facility. Um, and as, because of that, uh, we're able to see patients when they needed to be seen, when they wanted to be seen, and to then hook them up with primary care. Uh, and because of limited capacity, uh, it provided an important triage function to get the older, sicker patients in faster. We quickly grew a waiting list of over a year, uh, and this was a time when one of the most important things in raising funds, uh, uh, grant funds, was to be able to demonstrate need. And because we had clearly demonstrable great need, we were able to get a Hilburton grant <clears throat> at a time when the amount of money in the Massachusetts Hilburton program when we applied was $30,000 to pay one salary, but a suit uh, was filed against the Nixon administration which had impounded the Hilburton funds. The, the, they won the suit, the funds were released, the timetable remained the original timetable. The state had to award those funds quickly <laughs> and so we actually were able to uh, get those funds combined with community development block grant funds and mitigation money from the Massachusetts Port Authority to build our building at um, 10 Gove Street. Uh, I mention that because I think it's relevant both to what's going on in East Boston now with a new building and what's gone on here in terms of the Shapiro building. That the site of care is important. The way that the care looks to patients is important. We had, we had staff members who would not have their parents use the health center until it moved into nicer facilities. <laughs> so uh, I think w this is a, an important part of wh what people perceive, perceive as uh, being uh, care well cared for. Um, so the rest of the story, I think, is, is obvious to most of the people uh, in this room. We, we've continued to grow. We went from 30,000 to now 300,000 visits a year. Uh, we are, uh, the range of services has gone well beyond primary care to community-based programs dealing with 
obesity in children to education and training programs dealing with building the new workforce out from our community. So it's been a, a period of, uh, uh, of continued uh, rapid growth and, uh, and I think there are lessons for the future in how those services have been developed. The second thing I'd like to talk about is our uh, community-based research programs because again, I think they helped foreshadow uh, some of the perspectives that we will be uh, utilizing going forward. Um, the reason I actually got into East Boston was because I was an infectious disease fellow here and, and needed a research project uh, uh, and was assigned by my mentor uh, to work on a project that he'd been uh, envisioning uh, as part of a trial of is it worth treating blood pressure below a diastolic of 115. Uh, because at that time, the only randomized control trial that uh, measured the value of blood pressure treatment was the Veterans Administration trial. So uh, a, the, the challenge was developing an ethical study design uh, because you clearly couldn't use a placebo uh, trial when, you, when there's very strong belief that it was important and valuable to treat people at lower levels. So uh, a design was conceived, and this was, I think, the first example of it, of trying to provide the ideal care, the maximum level of care called step care, and to compare that with usual care. So uh, we had done the pilot for this hypertension detection and follow-up program in East Boston, and I was chairman of the committee that wrote the Manual of Operations, and so our challenge was to figure out how do you get people to come in and take their medicines and take care of their blood pressure, keep taking their medicines, and stay compliant and keep their blood pressure below a defined goal uh, for five years to the duration of the study. So basically we tried to think up everything we could that would help meet the needs and expectations of patients. Um, Medicines were free, clinic visits were free, um, the uh, uh, access was very important. There's a working class population who did not want to take time off from work, couldn't take time off from work, and yet didn't want to give up their evenings either. So it was important that we develop a mechanism to see them quickly and rapidly during the slight downtime between work and evening. Uh, so uh, we saw most of our patients uh, between five and seven in the evening. In order to be able to do that, to treat the number of patients that we had, we really needed to expand the workforce to be able to, to do that. So we actually developed the role of lay hypertension therapists, uh, taking very bright uh, college kids. This is before Joint Commission and <laughs> <laughs> regulation of all sorts. <laughs> that, actually, that's one of the wonders and, and uh, joys of the being involved at the, uh, early on. There was no regulation. <laughs> so you really could experiment and do whatever you wanted and, uh, and uh, people didn't bother you. Uh, so uh, we, so we, we really designed this program to try to make sure that people really, really kept their blood pressures under control. We saw them every six weeks. Uh, we saw them quickly and they uh, were able to uh, not have to have long waits or spend a huge amount of their time getting care. We, uh, on their visits, uh, the hypertension therapists uh, counted all of their pills to see if the proper number of pills were missing from each bottle. They, they operated by a very strict protocol that if the blood pressure wasn't sustained below a goal of 90, that they would advance uh, uh, along the line. There were physicians present, but the vast majority of care was provided by these um, lay therapists. Uh, the results of that trial, we actually were able to achieve 86% uh, cooperation and participation in the study through the full five years. And the net result was uh, a 17% reduction in mortality compared not to usual care, which is, which is what we were striving for, but to the greatly enhanced usual care because we actually took all of the people in the uh, regular care group back in for a blood pressure check every year and, uh, and uh, emphasized to them they had high blood pressure and sent a letter to their doctor that they had high blood pressure and so that those who were, weren't controlled were, were getting uh, 
good advice that was probably exceeded what would have been possible in normal primary care anyway. So um, that st study actually ended in, the, uh, in 1980. And in, the, in 1980, we then uh, launched a second set of uh, community-based research. Actually, in the first study, we had visited 13,000 households and measured the blood pressure of every person between the ages of 16 and 69 as part of the screening program. In the 80s, uh, we became one of three centers in a National Institute of Aging study known as Established Populations for Epidemiologic Study of the Elderly, or EPIs. And uh, again, we were able to do a detailed uh, interviews uh, lasting over an hour uh, with every person over 65 in the community, measuring their blood pressure, their pulmonary function, uh, providing standard questionnaires about chest pain and COPD cough, and, uh, and administering uh, mental status exams uh, to test for cognitive impairment. And did that actually every year from 1980 through 1986. Um, th this was uh, this was not the point of the study, but, it, but one of the observations we made that was that nursing home admissions in East Boston were less than half of the nursing home admissions in the comparison uh, communities in New Haven and North Carolina. So uh, I'll come back to, the, uh, to our comprehensive home care program. So then the third aspect uh, that I wanted to talk about that I think has uh, relevance for us going forward is the uh, special programs for our medically complex patients. And again, this has a very interesting sort of community uh, origin. Uh, when the health center started, the, uh, the uh, local uh, state representative was Monsignor at Holy Redeemer Church uh, and was a member of our health committee. And uh, his mother, who lived in East Boston and spoke only Italian, uh, had a stroke uh, which resulted in uh, hemiparesis and uh, significant disability and because of that she had to be put in a nursing home. It turned out that the nursing home that was available was not uh, language uh, friendly for somebody who spoke Italian at the time. And so he basically summoned me and uh, Dr. Ben Duffy who was working with us at the time to come meet with him in the rectory and basically challenged us to develop a program that would allow elders to stay in the community who clearly wanted to do that. So we went and got a permanent, permanent charities grant, permanent charities is now known as the Boston Foundation, uh, and a donated wonderful nurse from the Boston VNA. I don't think they donate nurses anymore. Uh, and, uh, and we're able to cobble together uh, what grew to be an absolutely comprehensive home care program that addressed uh, the broad range of uh, medical and social needs of homebound uh, elderly. Um, but, uh, and this may be a recurring theme in this talk as well, in early 1980s, Medicare decided they were paying for too much home care and uh, restricted it back to the first few days after discharge from the hospital. So this program, uh, uh, needed to find another way to become economically viable and sustainable. And a good friend of ours uh, approached Jack and, and uh, said, we really ought to go visit a community in Chinatown, uh, a program in Chinatown called Unlock, uh, which uh, actually the Chinese, Chinatown was 32,000 people, East Boston was 32,000 people at that time. Uh, and had been un they, the community had been unable to get the land to build a nursing home, and uh, the Chinese community clearly wanted to stay in the neighborhood. So they actually uh, adopted this model of care based on multidisciplinary teams operating out of uh, adult day health centers uh, and received a federal demonstration grant around capitation as the mechanism of paying for that. And their concerns when we visited was that if they didn't replicate, they couldn't hold on to their funds. So we became part of the first replication wave of that model of care, which is now known as PACE, or Program of All-Inclusive Care of the Elderly. 
Uh, and again, that was, uh, uh, allowed us to continue to take care of uh, frail elderly at home and in the community uh, when we were no longer able to sustain our, uh, our comprehensive home care program. And that model of care, uh, I think, is very instructive for us for, uh, and very current in terms of as we think forward to what may be coming under health care reform. Uh, the model of care was global capitation, meaning Medicare gave us what they thought was 95% of what they spent for a Medicare patient. Medicaid paid a roughly the same, about 95% of what they thought they spent on nursing home patients. The idea was that the federal government was saving money and that that money was given to the organization who then became totally responsible for all the chronic and rehabilitative care for, for the patients in the program. We're so enamored with the model of care that we went back to Robert Wood Johnson who provided the initial funding uh, uh, for the PACE, uh, startup funding for the PACE program and for the replication program and projected uh, and proposed that we do a similar model of care for patients with HIV and AIDS. <clears throat> and they did in fact give us money to start that program, which then uh, was sustained on Ryan White funding uh, through the Special Programs of National Significance Grants. And we were able to develop our Project Shine, which is a, again, a multidisciplinary uh, program that looks at the patients with HIV and AIDS in a, in a more global context, not just uh, around specific medical visits, but their whole, uh, the, all of the challenges in their life. And we also <coughs> uh, extended this model. We were able to recruit Dr. Tom Silva, a uh, young pediatric uh, developmental uh, disabilities uh, pediatrician who came and helped us uh, use this model for <coughs> severely disabled and uh, technology dependent infants and children and uh, did that really, um, when I, uh, reading the literature about that model at that time, I came across for the very first time the term medical home. This is a term that had been in the pediatric literature uh, longer than it got into general circulation as it is now. <laughs> um, so those were the three programs that uh, I wanted to share with you. Um, whoops, wrong direction, sorry. We then entered the tumultuous 90s. <laughs> uh, you may have heard this before, but healthcare costs were unsustainable, growing at a rate that simply could not be sustained. <laughs> so this was a national crisis and hadn't gone away yet. <clears throat> but uh, uh, partly in response to that crisis and also in response to the desire to make healthcare uh, universally available, the, uh, Bill Clinton, when he was elected, uh, uh, launched the, his health care uh, reform uh, efforts. Uh, Medicare, uh, HMOs were already thriving in many parts of the country. Uh, California seemed to be ahead of the pack and um, Medicare H HMOs uh, uh, were a big business there and uh, a, a program called Pacificare, uh, a for-profit uh, HMO in California came and approached Tufts Health Plan to develop uh, Secure Horizons, which was the first Massachusetts uh, uh, globally at risk uh, um, Medicare HMO. And H uh, Harvard Community Health Plan followed soon after with their first seniority program. Uh, and what happened in the medical culture was the absolute conviction that in order to survive and thrive, you really needed to develop tightly integrated, vertically integrated systems. While other hospitals were going out and building health centers, Mass General opened a health center in Revere, considerably spiffed up the health center in Chelsea, and we basically said to the Beth Israel, why can't we do this together if you're going to set up a health center within a mile and a half of us? <laughs> and they said, well, that's an interesting idea. They said, no, no, this is really not the model of care we want, but don't worry, uh, we're not going to compete for your patients. But they did compete for our staff. So we um, actually approached partners by this time they had merged and said, could we take our admissions and move them to the Brigham? And they said, um, 
Yeah, if you really, really want to, but why don't you do it at the general? We've dealt with the general for almost 20 years now, and we are clearly the local medical doctor <laughs> who isn't necessary to be involved in any aspect of healthcare, <laughs> nor do we need to communicate with you. So they said, well, the world has changed. And to prove it, they actually gave us our own floor, allowed our physicians to be the on-floor attendings, allowed our nurse partners to uh, do uh, inpatient case management in the hospital. For a period of time, I think we had one of the most integrated systems that we've ever seen in terms of us being the managers of care in the hospital and in the community, uh, solving many problems of communication and goals and management. But all good things come to an end, and uh, again, Medicare, <laughs> the Balanced Budget Act was passed, which uh, significantly reduced payments, particularly for Medicare HMOs. The HMOs said, okay, um, <clears throat> there are these parts of our business which are losers. Let's put those onto the primary care providers or onto the providers, <laughs> the providers including the hospitals. The hospitals said, this doesn't work anymore financially, and the hospitals pulled out, and so Medicare HMOs basically shut down. And unfortunately, we went through a period of bankruptcy because we had built a system which simply was not sustainable uh, <coughs> in, in, a, in, the pay, in that payment mechanism. We recovered within the year with uh, really uh, sustaining all of our programs in East Boston, uh, which continued to thrive. We did have to close the Winthrop Health Center and the Logan Health Center. But um, that was the tumultuous 90s. Now we're gonna go to what are the issues in the new millennium? <laughs> uh, patient safety and quality, cost, and our, our, we've got to reduce cost, we've got to deliver high quality care, and the way to do that is through practice redesign. So that's the marching orders. And the, story, the history of the uh, patient safety movement really uh, has its uh, strong roots in the uh, Institute of Medicine uh, uh, book or, or report called To Air is Human, which was followed a, a year and a half later by the Institute of Medicine report called, call it, called Crossing the Quality Chasm. Again, where uh, the lack of safety, the problems, the dysfunction within the system were spelled out, and the goals of where we should be going were articulated, of patient-centered care, which is safe, effective, efficient, timely, and equitable. And uh, the Institute of Medicine became an effector organ for all of these changes, working with many healthcare systems throughout the country. For federally qualified health centers, uh, HRSA developed uh, what's called, what they call the Health Disparities Collaboratives. Um, which, and every federally qualified health center was mandated to participate in these, which were uh, improvement templates, really, uh, 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 focused around chronic diseases and the uh, 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 diabetes, uh, coronary heart disease, asthma, depression, uh, uh, medication safety. Um, and these, these, uh, this was really a, a methodology uh, of developing breakthrough levels of, rap, of improvements in both operations and care, and doing it through rapid cycle test teams, small teams, working to do rapid cycle testing of good ideas, to see which good ideas actually worked. <laughs> looking at the system, looking at what's broken, taking a little piece of it, and saying, can we make this piece better? Trying it, if it, if it works, uh, expanding on that. If it fails, drop that and move on to something else. And that was the methodology. Um, and we were uh, active participants in that. The, uh, the other sort of template uh, which was uh, put forward was the uh, template of the patient-centered medical home, the characteristics of what uh, would make for ideal practice. And um, here in uh, Massachusetts, the Massachusetts League of Health Centers uh, was one of seven uh, uh, grantees in one of seven states where they uh, 
patient-centered medical home model was being uh, promulgated. Uh, Massachusetts itself, in terms of the state of Massachusetts, in order to prepare for payment reform, which uh, uh, was clearly the next stage in, uh, in uh, health care reform, uh, uh, developed its own uh, patient-centered medical home. Uh, what's, uh, I think what's obvious to everybody in this room is that to do this requires very, very strong uh, IT support. Uh, and uh, so the development of the electronic medical record and other aspects of uh, patient and operational support using information technology became absolutely an essential piece of delivering good, current, safe care and for being able to uh, move toward the goal of the type of care that we all want to give. Um, a, 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 <clears throat> the importance of uh, IT was uh, stressed in the federal funding for, uh, 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 for supporting, providing support to every practicing physician in the country through uh, the uh, meaningful use mechanism. So um, the legal structures that are thrusting us forward, <laughs> uh, this first was the, uh, in 2006, Mass General Laws Chapter 58, known uh, as Romney Care, uh, with global payment and, uh, linked to performance and quality measures. Uh, and those quality measures include, uh, very importantly, the patient experience. Uh, commercial insurers have moved very rapidly to, assume, to move away from fee-for-service and to move towards more global payment type mechanisms. Uh, the Blue Cross contract that we've all just entered into together, uh, health centers and the hospital, it is an example of that. And uh, we're all aware that the, in 2010, the Federal Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act was passed, which is now being debated in the Supreme Court. But whatever happens in the Supreme Court, Massachusetts, and I think the country, uh, is moving rapidly because simply the old system is not affordable and better care and is possible and therefore uh, I think the momentum will not be lost. So I, in the last few minutes I'd just like to talk about some examples of practice transformation that are going on in East Boston uh, and uh, to, to uh, make some points <laughs> after we've uh, sort of quickly reviewed them. Uh, the um, uh, just had the name on uh, <laughs> Health Disparities Collaborative <laughs> uh, resulted in us uh, de developing, uh, Anita Morris, developing within the health center a department uh, focused on chronic disease education and management, which quickly became our incubator for new ideas. Uh, 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 that this uh, team uh, working on, uh, again, identifying areas where care could be improved uh, and uh, uh, would, uh, went through a, a, a process of developing more and more broader programs around what supports patients, uh, initially beginning with patients with diabetes, then spreading it to, uh, to uh, cardiovascular disease, and now we're very actively involved in spreading it to asthma. Um, and again, taking this methodology and this uh, frame of mind and moving it from the CDEM department out into the various clinical departments so that each clinical department is developing its own sort of beta test team or pilot teams who are uh, working on the intractable issues that get in the way of us providing the kind of care we want to, and meeting with a significant success. Uh, referrals tracking and, uh, and retrieval is an area of enormous improvement, and, and uh, our ARM program that Mary Ellen Sheehan developed and supervises has been a wonderful benefit in terms of being able to get your patient to the specialist, 
to know when the appointment is, to get the, uh, to get, make sure that it actually happens. And that is, uh, that has been a difficult and challenging uh, 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 area. Uh, we're now <coughs> trying, using different models, uh, uh, ways of importing specialist notes, discharge summaries, images, x-ray images, and uh, um, ER visits <coughs> into the electronic medical record even when they occur at Boston Medical Center. So that the ways of actually uh, making the kinds of things that used to be beyond your wildest dreams to have in real time at the time you're seeing the patient <laughs> now are available without uh, 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 requiring great effort on the part of a, a PCP. Um, we're working on systems for systematic post-discharge visits and systematic post-emergency room visits when it's appropriate to make sure that those happen without uh, a lot of effort and thought uh, uh, so that they, they become uh, making, making the clinical, clinic visit maximally productive and, uh, and tolerable for both in length of time to the patient and and in terms of effort to the PCP, uh, a lot of work within the teams to s prepare for the visit in advance so you know exactly what it is that needs to be done. Many pieces that don't need to be done by the physician can be pre-done uh, at the time of the visit. And uh, the, so um, uh, one of the more recent and uh, uh, again uh, projects that delights uh, providers is uh, we're using AmeriCorps volunteers to do uh, a case management, navigation, uh, assisting of patients around all of those things that get in the way of doing what they need to do to improve their health. So the point here is that uh, the system is improving. It has been improving since 1963, dramatic improvements. Uh, but, it, but that rate of improvement is going to be accelerating even more as our payment and as our uh, 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 survival really depends on it. So I wanted to share just a few of the things that are sort of, I think, examples of this. How are we doing? Uh, one, of, I'm, one of my favorite committees is our Medication Safety Committee. Uh, it's, a, it's a meeting in which uh, the medical directors from all the clinical departments and the uh, director of the pharmacy and uh, another pharmacist, uh, uh, head of our Coumadin clinic and some, and some mid-level mid providers, sit around each month and go through all of the adverse drug events that have occurred in the, uh, and re been reported in the past month. This, uh, they do this with the patient's chart in front of them on the screen and then go through and dissect all of the different places that something went wrong or could have gone wrong and then with the help of IT who's present in that meeting develop strategies to decrease the likelihood that that will occur again. And that's, uh, this has been a uh, we never run out of, of interesting and exciting challenges. Um, one of the first big challenges was, uh, this was several years ago, uh, a patient uh, who was on Coumadin had an intracranial bleed, uh, devastating bleed. His INR was in fact well controlled at the time that that occurred, but simultaneously with that we had another patient who so INR was uh, well above uh, where it uh, could safely be. And because uh, we couldn't reach them by phone, by home visits, we, we uh, were really terrified that uh, we actually did finally reach that patient before he got on the plane to Columbia, which he was scheduled to do. But that really uh, stimulated us to take a very thorough look at the anticoagulation program we had, which at that time each doc was managing their own patients uh, by their own protocols. <laughs> uh, and we developed point of care testing so that the tests could be done at the, the, could, the results were available at the time of visit. 
The counseling and uh, medication adjustments could be done while the patient was still there. And then develop, uh, and then developed very uh, detailed protocols for what the appropriate, uh, and turned all medication, uh, all Coumadin management over to uh, the Coumadin clinic within our CDM team. Um, it's been, uh, it, uh, again, it's been a wonderful uh, journey uh, where we continue to identify new ways to make, it, uh, make things safer. Uh, there are lots of other examples of better communication between providers that we're beginning to experience. Uh, wonderful things have happened in relationships with our BMC specialists in terms of levels of communication and access to appointments. Uh, wonderful things in terms of digital radiology and being able to actually have our films taken in East Boston and read here. Uh, um, as I say, uh, Many of these are workarounds, not the ideal perfect final system, but, but major improvements uh, going forward, having discharge summaries in the patient's chart when they're seen, um, uh, lab reports, et cetera. A uh, lot of improvements made around safer transitions between care. That's certainly an area that uh, Ryan and the Family Medicine Department have been central in helping with. Um, we're using new technologies in, in really exciting ways. Uh, use, use of uh, computer-generated letters for all sorts of things that really uh, help to uh, communicate more effectively with our patients. Telephone calls in East Boston are, are difficult because there may be multiple families living in the same household that may, uh, people work uh, two jobs, trying to, so alternative ways to reaching patients. Uh, Televox calls for clinic reminders uh, and for preventive care reminders and for seeking out particular subpopulations where there's something you need to uh, apply to them. Uh, by linking with the computer, you're able to do those sorts of things. Uh, we've worked a lot on improved access, which I think is one of the really critical issues of patient satisfaction and dissatisfaction. And, uh, We've done it in a variety of ways. We, we had a wonderful demonstration of taking a department in which the no-show rate was 30, 40 uh, percent, and taking, redesigning it so that now, basically, when a provider or a patient needs a, a mental health visit, they get it that moment, and literally go and. Uh, and by the way that's been structured, uh, uh, what we call mental health open access, by changing the model of care, we've been able to dramatically uh, make that much more relevant to the patient's problems. I, I want to take one little improvement project <laughs> that we're particularly proud of uh, as, our, as my last. Uh, this is uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, we, we, during the influenza epidemic, we suffered uh, major surges of patients in our emergency room that created uh, very frightening scenarios where too many patients, we tried to get them off to other departments. Uh, uh, but we, we, we really decided that we really needed to do something to improve access to our emergency. And so, uh, Several of our staff went off to the, uh, an IHI uh, training program on emergency room flow redesign and brought back lean technologies to be applied to the functioning of our emergency room. Uh, we um, measured, you won't believe all the things we measured. <laughs> we measured patient arrival times by the hour, by the day, and plotted those out each week, week uh, to learn when, are, when is the peak times of peak demand. And then the even harder thing is adjusting schedules so that you really have the ideal number of physicians, nurses, support staff at the times of greatest demand so that patients can be seen quickly. Uh, total redesign of the, uh, of the triage process, uh, the possibility of doing rapid triage and dis dismissal of patients who had simple problems that could be 
uh, handled before they even got back in the room, uh, making sure that patients with complicated problems got in the face of the doctor within a minute or two, uh, taking the registration process and moving it out of the way and either having it in the room or much later in the visit so that the patient's issues are being attended to, not the administrative issues. Uh, so, and many other things, but I just wanted to tell you what the results of this have been because it's been, they've been far more dramatic than I would expect. Waiting time has gone down. Length of time, stay in the emergency room has dropped from 3.4 hours to less than two hours. Waiting rooms are emptying and the volume has gone up by 10% and the waiting rooms are empty because of the, uh, but more important than that is the fact that this, uh, all of the staff have felt ownership for this project. Stelianos, who's here somewhere, I think. I said, yeah. <laughs> uh, as the uh, um, emergency room med medical director has had beginning and end of the day huddles. And the, uh, the roles of all of the staff have been defined and they all take pride in their roles and they all take pride in what they're doing. I actually know this as a fact. Uh, I went in, I, I got part of my hearing aid stuck in my ear and was afraid that I was gonna make it worse. So I went in and everybody said how much nicer it is to be working there, how exciting it is to work there. They all take pride in their jobs. Unsolicited, we've had many letters and phone calls from patients and from board members saying, what happened? <laughs> it really is uh, dramatic. So uh, the reason that I, I uh, so we have empty waiting rooms and happy patients, and even more uh, heartwarming is staff who really take pride in, in the work they're doing. So what have we learned? Uh, Here's, this is just to show you we did a lot of measurements. This is each step of the way being measured and how it's been impacted by the, by the uh, improvements at each of those steps. So these are my lessons from the past 50 years. Number one, we're going to be going through a very tumultuous time in which all sorts of things are going to be asked of us. And uh, I think it's very important that we all keep focused on what is the real mission which is the health and well-being of our patients. There are lots of other incentives that we're going to have to dance to, but we, we need to keep focused on that. And very centrally, keep focused on the patient experience. Um, the secret of patient care, one of the healing secrets of patient care, is actually caring for and respecting the patient. And. Um, in the old model, that was uh, between the doc and the patient. We now, the model of care is team care, which means that each member of the team owns that responsibility of, as well to care, to project to the patient's care and respect to every patient. But for them to do that means that our teams really have to be real teams in which the team members show care and respect for each other, that they appreciate the contribution of each uh, different team member, as we are all going to be asked to rise to the level of our license or ability. <laughs> it's critically important that, what, who, 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 that all members of the team sense their critical personal role in the delivery of care. Uh, I, I, again, I, in my recent dermatology visit here, <laughs> there was a long wait in the waiting room, in the, in the room. Staff coming in and saying, we're really sorry. We're really running behind today. Is it, you know, do you want to reschedule? Is it okay? And keeping checking in made that long wait go from a, being a time of stress and anger to a time of understanding and feeling fine. <laughs> so every member of the team is, is crucial. And uh, we don't just belong to our, our primary care team. We belong to a variety of concentric teams, the team, us and our specialists, us and our inpatient uh, partners, 
us and our nursing home people, us, us and our home care, all of us must view ourselves as team members with a common goal who are there to support and make sure that this works best in terms of the experience of our patients. The fourth lesson is don't be constrained by the old ways of thinking. There clearly are a lot of different ways of doing things that may work a lot better, but we just got to have the imagination to think about them and to test them, make sure whether they do or not, and then give up old ways and old perspectives. And, if, uh, uh, <clears throat> and fifth is, and again, I think this is a very important lesson that we shouldn't shy away from our failures or bad outcomes and try to sweep them under the rug. We should savor them and learn from them and carefully analyze them and say, what is the opportunity that this bad thing can teach us about making sure that it's much less likely to happen in the future? And that attitude is critically important in all of us. At the same time, I think we really need to savor our successes, um, large and small, because uh, we're going to go through a rough time and we no need whatever pleasure we can get. <laughs> and uh, the, the uh, shared pleasure of our successes can keep us going, even in hard times. And the final lesson is take the long view. We may expect many successes and many failures and it's really the shared journey that's going to sustain us. We're never going to get there. <laughs> so thank you very much.